Hi and welcome to episode 45 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us at the Page One Podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about uh, the writing process, how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. We've got a big back catalogue of episodes there, some great guests from the past few episodes, even Alistair Campbell in the past few episodes and going back further you've got people like Joe Cornish, Sarah Pimbra, Peter James, There's a, there's a whole array of people you can get hints and tips from and hear some good stories from as well so do check out the previous episodes we've got another great guest this week we do indeed this week we are chatting with ian dunt who is a political writer he's written a number of articles for websites such as washington post the guardian he's the editor of the politics.co.uk website he's also written a couple of books the first one was called Brexit, What the Hell Happens Now? And the second one, How to Be a Liberal, is out now, newly out, and yeah. it's a really interesting read. It is. It's, it's a, a, as we discussed with you, and you know, writing about politics, sometimes it, these things can be very dry. Um, but How to Be a Liberal, I think, is a very important book. Mm-hmm. And you get the importance of it just from reading the introduction to the book and sort of talking about why it's important in this day and age just now but also the each chapter is sort of a moving through the history of liberalism and told in a in quite a interesting and sort of narrative way that yeah you maybe yeah. wouldn't have thought it was you know if you knew it was a book just about politics yeah i think i think that's right i think it is more of a history book as than his first book was i think you are mm-hmm. getting that kind of historical context uh, and it, from what he says, it sounds like it was an absolute hell to write. Yeah, I think, I think it's fair <laughs> to say he didn't enjoy writing it. <laughs> but but I think the the finished product is great, so it's definitely worth checking out. And we, we do talk about that and talk about the process that he went through, talk about his uh, rather unique um, drunken draft uh, yes, approach. something I've not tried myself, but <laughs> yeah, I might, but might have, to, have to give that a go. I, I like the sound of that. Um, and, uh, you know, the narrative that he brings to these things... Uh, including the stories on his website and the books is sort of born from a uh, Batman comic, Superman comics, yes. this, the sort of narrative of here's, here's a big event and then going back and finding out how you got to that situation, which, which mm-hmm. was interesting to hear as well. So it's a really interesting and really fun chat that we had with Ian. I should yep. make a warning in case you don't know Ian from his social media he is fond of a swear word or two, as are we, I should add, hasten to add. But um, <laughs> just in case you're sensitive to such things, there is quite a lot of swearing in this episode. Um, but do give it a listen. I hope that doesn't put you off. And we'll be back at the end of the podcast to chat a bit more and let you know about next week's guest, who is another great one. On with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a 
comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. You started in journalism. Did you always have a desire to write as as a kid when you were growing up? Was that where you wanted to end up? Yeah, I was all right at writing when I was a kid. I do remember, like, I think I won an award when I was eight for creative writing or something like that. So it was always something I was I was okay at. Um, but that sort of went to pot in university. I did philosophy in university, which was basically a result of like taking too much acid when I was 16. And thinking, <laughs> oh, maybe I should fucking talk about, you know, is the table really that, you know, and then of course you get to university and it's like formal logic and, like, yeah. you know, the, an epistemology. And you're like, well, this doesn't seem so fun anymore. And maybe our <laughs> original idea was, was foolhardy. Um, and there's no, there's, especially in sort of, you know, the British and the sort of analytical school of philosophy, there's no flourish. To, to the writing at all mm -hmm. you know it's extremely structured um so all of that went and i sort of didn't really think of the right of myself as someone who wrote particularly well or, or anything like that i um, coming out of uni and then i started most of my thoughts around career was sort of pretty sort of embarrassing but i'm not going to pretend it was otherwise stuff around well you know how do you best change the world how do you mm -hmm. improve the world and so for a while i was thinking it was law and then i thought well, I should, you know the, the classic thing of everyone wants to be a human rights lawyer and so they realized that human rights law kind of doesn't exist yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's like five positions in britain right yeah. and you <laughs> might be lucky to get one of them and yeah. that's about that um and then i thought that would also be a lot of hard work uh and i don't really want to work very hard in my life so i became a journalist <laughs> fair enough <laughs> um and uh so where where did you start out being a journalist what was the path into it for you the first uh, the first internship i did i mean i did two i think i, I in my life, I think it's like three weeks total that I worked unpaid, which is really good because I'm, I'm, my guess is if you start now, you should probably mm -hmm. work yourself for more than that. Um, so I think I did a week at Pink News, which is a gay news site, which is still around. Um, and then I did two weeks at um, another site. I did, I think I did a week maybe at the Indy. Right. Um, so little bits and bobs and then, but basically just getting into I'm just, you know, I, I still remember the first day of being told it's by Tony Grew, who's still still working journalist, a friend of mine, um, who just looked at what I wrote and went, yeah, so in a news story, there's more than just one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So we're starting with the basics. Um, uh, but, you know, being sent out, being told, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, don't feel anyone, you just fucking go talk to whoever you damn yeah. well please, get in their face, talk to them, come back, we work it out. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was not that journalism isn't that difficult it's sort of one of those things that the more you think about it the the more over complicated you make it but ultimately it's just go talk to people find a fucking story like it, mm -hmm. it is not that hard um so and yeah that, the introduction wasn't too difficult and is that similar is it the, the same now because we've chatted to a few, a few a few authors who have and everyone seems to have a very different way into the industry and some folk do creative writing classes and some folk come to it from having done no writing experience and you know and and is, is it still the same way that if you get if you want to go into that kind of line of line of writing, it's just a case of writing to people and doing it and trying to get places again a week here and a week there, and that experience is more important almost than than doing a course in it, perhaps. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I this is always the thing that fucking journalists say, and, and I know it sounds right, but I, I don't really get what the courses are for. Mm -hmm. You need training in media law. I mean, I think someone could pretty much train you up in media law in about a week because the truth is, media law is it's kind of like playing battleships. It's not like there's just, you can't do this. Yeah. It's, you really do have to evaluate what's the likelihood that someone's going to sue. Um, would it be in their interest? Would they have the financial possibility of doing it? Would they think there was anything financially in it for them for suing you, which usually for most journalists, the answer to that is no. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing to gain. So it, that, it's just allowed contempt of court is just not a very hard thing to figure yeah. out. When a journalist fucks that up, you're like, well, you just clearly know absolutely nothing if this is something that you failed at. Um, so most of it, I think you just get in there, hopefully you'll, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of dicks in journalism, but usually there's enough good people that will sort of, if they think you've got a bit of skill, they'll just be like, no, no, we do it this way. And this is a much better way to put it. You know, don't say amidst whatever you do, because everyone will think you're a twat. Like, put them <laughs> you know, and, and, and off you go. And as long as you, you know, as long as you make yourself sort of useful, really, that's all you need is just be useful. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you should, you should sort of be all right. There's so much negativity around journalism. I find of like people going, they love, I remember this, like when I was that age, journalists loved going to places and going, well, you know, it's fucked. You know, you'll never get a job. This yeah. is a terrible news sort of thing. I think you're just saying that to make yourself feel better. 
And right now, obviously, especially right now, it's a really tough time. Lots of people are losing their jobs, but it's also very fluid in journalism. And often, you know, if, if you can afford to take the hit with just six months of low pay, you've got a chance to get yourself into, mm. into, into a pretty secure position. I think it's more optimistic than some people make out. And has the has the uh, sort of playing field opened up in the sense of the the internet as well? You know, has that given much more opportunity, or is there a danger that people just end up being drowned out? You know, they they end up writing a blog somewhere that no one is ever going to pick up and read, and so they don't get anywhere with it. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely written several of those blogs. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's definitely a, a bit of that, but I mean, my career was. You know, my career is all internet based. Uh -huh. right? I mean, I write for newspapers. I write for the Washington Post, the Guardian. I, I write for magazines and newspapers. Mm -hmm. I do a bunch of stuff on TV, and obviously, I write books. But predominantly, my journalism career has been online. Mm -hmm. And when I imagine the punter, I imagine someone on their phone. I yeah. don't imagine them, you know, reading a newspaper. <laughs> like statistically, that's a pretty good thing to imagine yeah. because that's what's happening. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, and so yeah, I mean, that was my experience. I didn't have to go through. You know, if, if, if I had started probably even 10 years before, I would have probably been going through local newspapers, which is, hard. there is a negative side to what I'm talking about, but by the way, which is essentially a class point that I think the reduction in, in people coming through local newspapers is a reduction in working class voices mm -hmm. in journalism, because that was just a way of getting in, which is pretty much gone now. If you look around my office in Parliament, um, in our office, they, they jumbled together with the digital guys and the local newspaper guys, and gradually the digital guys have been growing and the local newspaper guys have been, you know, yeah. going over the last sort of eight, eight years really, um, as they get shut down. So that bit, you know, a bit more fluid, you can start online and that's a slightly different kind of journalism. It's a more egalitarian form. It's a more mm -hmm. conversational form. Mm -hmm. And the structure of the way in which you write can become looser. And for the kind of stuff that I do, the, the bits that I'm really interested in is where we're, trying to take the word, to me, the word blog, which is often this very dismissive word, mm -hmm. and trying to actually put some quality behind that to say, look, there, there, there are things that don't have to be an opinion piece, and they're not a news story either. They're informing people, they're equipping people with true understanding that they can, you know, you will have to learn to trust my judgment. If you keep on finding that I'm wrong, you will no longer trust me. But mm -hmm. as long as you keep on finding that the facts I'm saying are right, then you can build some trust with me. Yeah. And you know where I'm coming from, I can make this opinion I can give you information at the same time. So even if you don't agree with me, you're still getting news from me. And that kind of, block, we're at the beginning of that form of journalism, which is a new kind of journalism, a subtly different kind. And it, certainly that's where I've had my career. It, it's almost like, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of who the journalist is, who the writer is. It's, it's almost, I don't want to say it's a brand, but you know what I mean? You're, if you know someone, then, you know, if you know who you are, you kind of understand your mindset going into the reading the piece and so you know you know you bring all this background information about you whereas i suppose in an old style newspaper piece you wouldn't necessarily look at who had written the you wouldn't look at the byline you'd look at the story and just sort of read that at least mm -hmm. most people would anyway and um, whereas now i think it seems that there are certain people online that that have sort of gathered uh you know you get big following on social media for example and then that drives people to your opinion pieces and blogs etc like that that sort of thing so i suppose it has changed in that way is that is that fair yeah to say? and that's the culmination of a long yeah. process right mm -hmm. like you go back to the beginning of journalism and there were no fucking bylines yeah you know? uh -huh. I mean, this is the growth of the journalist as some as as a figure that anyone would be even halfway interested in as a person mm -hmm. um and of course there's there are downsides to that, and we're not going to start naming them now, but it wouldn't be hard for any of us to start thinking of the kind of names that we're like, yeah, that's that's where an ego is going against their yeah. journalism. Yeah. Um, but th there is also hopefully some some degree of, it's not, it, it, basically it's a bond of trust that you can establish and that provides a viable sort of honor mechanism for decent journalism because you think i want to maintain a reputation mm -hmm. right i don't i want that if i got something wrong it can be justified i can explain it but i'm not just going to start spaffing off any old wank into my coffee because mm -hmm. i'm going to lose my reputation mm -hmm. and on that basis you can maintain something that we're basically losing sort of across like the political class really like you know the idea of honor the idea that your reputation will be tan tarnished by telling untruths now that is all in severe decline in the political arena. Yeah. And yet there are ways in which in online, in journalism, we can actually reestablish that principle and make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, that's really um, 
a, a good point because I think I've certainly seen on, online, especially social media, you know, people fall into camps and um, they, they choose to follow the voices at, you know, echo chamber of their own, etc. And do you think if you're able to come across as honest, then you perhaps cross that line and you get people who say, well, I don't agree with his views, but I trust, you know, but I, I know he's not going to lie about stuff or, 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 or do people tend to just say, or do, do they psychologically just block out anything, either, even if it's a if, it, if it's a truth, do they block that out if he doesn't agree with them? Yeah, so this is, I mean, I mean, you basically just got to the heart of our entire social <laughs> dilemma, right? <laughs> like, and and the the reality is, these are nonsense numbers, but the reality is, my my instinct towards it is about seventy percent of people are quite instinctively tribal mm-hmm. in their approach towards information processing. Um, and this is not new, by the way. Like George Orwell, when George Orwell was writing about this um, in 1949, uh, no, it can't have been. It was, it was just after, I think it was 1945 in Notes on Nationalism, where he defines nationalism as a block where you think these are the people, it doesn't have to be a country, it can mm-hmm. be, he said the most common kind was British jingoism, but he thought even pacifism, you know, or Zionism would be examples of these things, where you'd have people in a block and you define them, you, you, you assess information by virtue of whether it makes your block of humanity look better. Mm-hmm. That was his impression. So this is not new. We've just found new technological mechanisms for making it much more severe. <laughs> yeah. but, but nevertheless, there's like, I would say a good 30% of people who will still listen, even when they don't generally agree with you on, on pretty much all sides. Um, I had a, a bloke the other day on Twitter who I think I would probably detest if I met. I mean, he'd, he'd, li- he'd literally written for Breitbart before, which you mm-hmm. don't know, just this grotesque yeah. white supremacy. Sort of. and, and he was complaining about something I'd written about refugees, and he was being absolutely appalling, you know, just saying the most dreadful things about me. It's pretty standard <laughs> for, for the discussion. <laughs> um, and someone said, oh, who is this guy? You know, what a dick. And he went, he said, yeah, he's, he's I think he says, like, he's, he's an absolute cunt on politics and economics, but he's good on free speech. And I still thought, fair enough, fair enough. Like, at least you can do yeah. you know, like... That's somebody who, who definitely sees, you know, what, right where, wherever you want, and I'll hate you for it, but feel mm-hmm. free to write in it, yeah. Well, and he'd obviously read enough to come yeah. to establish yeah. where he did and didn't agree with me. He hadn't just written me off for all yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So you're like, yeah. well, there's hope for the world if there's <laughs> if the people that are calling me a cunt still have this degree of participation to the manner in which they do it, right? <laughs> And one thing your columns always have, I think, you know, you're very good at distilling what are complex issues a lot of the time, uh, political okay. issues, into easy to understand articles or columns. Uh, and often they're quite humorous as well. You know, what, it, how have you, is that something you've always been able to do or, or is that a skill that you've developed as you've gone gone on? I don't know. I, I am super flattered by you saying that because that's the main function of, my job like as i see it right now like that is that is my main job is basically like an english comprehension exercise mm-hmm. which is when you talk to super smart specialist people you, you you get over that natural this is the key part is getting over that natural human embarrassment about saying i don't understand mm-hmm. and then the really hard part is being prepared to say that a third time <laughs> and a fourth <laughs> you know when they're when, at the point that they're like come on man like for fuck's sake I, I, this isn't hard <laughs> But it is hard for me, like all of this stuff, like trade is really hard for me. Financial services is, I mean, in fact, pretty much all the economics I find incredibly difficult. All philosophy, which I've spent the last two years of my life sort of writing about, is really, I find very, very hard indeed. And I think that sort of makes you better at it. So you just keep on asking until you finally get it. And then you're in a position to write about it. But I, I don't, it's not about coming up with a set sort of way of explaining it. I think ultimately that stuff is, if you find it hard, if you really get to the point where you properly understand it, then you're in a position to do it. You can spot the ones who don't really understand it because they're still using the complicated language. Yeah. They're still using the, the, the lexicon, basically. Mm-hmm. And usually because they're scared to deviate from the precise language because they think it might mean something wrong. You really know you've got something when you're just confident writing it out in a simple way. Mm-hmm. So I think most of that is just making sure you, you actually fucking understand it. And that takes a really, really long time. Yeah. And it's not a particularly socially rewarding thing because it's kind of an iceberg, right? Like all of the work is, but if, if you've done it right, all of the work is beneath the surface. They should just be able to see the very, the very tip of yeah. something. It should look much easier than it really is. And do you think 
you know, I I follow you on Twitter, and that that to be honest is the first way that I encountered your work. It, and obviously, you have to be very succinct, and you're quite mm-hmm. blunt as well on Twitter. I think it's fair to say. But you know, do you think that helps as well? You know, you you have that limitation, so you you hone in on what you want to say and what you need to say about something very quickly. Yeah, well, we used to say that, right? And the, but the truth is, as soon as threads became a thing, yeah. like for anyone you know who still has a social life, a thread is like where you link together a bunch of tweets. That kind of just fell out the window, and and it's hard to give it too much shit, right? Because lots of the best stuff I've read on Twitter is like part of a twenty-four part yeah. thread. Mm-hmm. So by that stage, kind of it fell out. I mean, for a while that was there. I remember that interview. Do you remember there was an interview way back where they asked David Cameron if he was on Twitter? Um. And he said, too many tweets makes a twat, which was probably mm. the wittiest thing he'd ever said um, <laughs> or ever will. And then, of course, he had to instantly apologize for it. Um, but one of the things they said, oh, do you think it's just not um, it's not a great medium for communicating political messages because you've got to be so short? And he was like, not really, mate, because if you can't communicate your political message in 140 characters, you've got a problem. Mm. Like, there's a politician, yeah. there's, there's an issue there. So it used to work that way. I mean, now I think that's kind of gone. And actually, most of the good stuff I read on Twitter actually is either... That's very, right. very short, yeah. or very, very long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And another thing, I suppose, with writing the way that you do about the topics that you do is that sometimes, you, especially in the last 18 months or so, you've had to write things at a very short deadline. So you're having to distill a, a complicated day in Parliament, uh, you know, that goes on until God knows what time. Uh, and then you're having to then go and write a, compre- a comprehensive piece about that. I mean, how do you, you know, what we often ask writers that are on this is, do you sit and plan out what you're going to write? How long do you spend planning and stuff like that? But it strikes me that you can't spend that much time doing that because you have to get it out there because the right, internet, right. because it's an internet piece. Yeah, yeah. You want you want to be super quick. So, um, I, I mean, most of my sort of training for that was just like reading a, a shitload of superhero comics like pretty much the only <laughs> like the only narrative structure i use is basically a superhero narrative structure so you usually want like to open up at the peak of the action you know so basically how does about this is but this is the, the whole structure my first book um uh, brexit what the hell happens mm-hmm. now was originally written in quite a boring way it was sort of i mean i'm not saying it was the most fantastically gripping piece of you know, <laughs> brave description you've ever fucking read but no, no, no. it was even more boring <laughs> like where it was just like you know here is what the eu is here is britain deciding to leave here is the room and when i was sort of going through it with the publisher we were like there is something it's just a bit worthy at the moment and then i sort of sat down and i was reading a batman comic and i thought oh of course like how does a batman story start a Batman story starts with Batman swinging above like a vat of acid or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, and then they're like, well, you're doomed, mate. And then you flick back to the beginning of the story yeah. and you get to the climax. Mm-hmm. Most of those, if I'm having to do them on a short time scale, most of them start with some form of climax or at least some form of description of the, the sort of the crucial dramatic or uh, moment or the moment of political sort of repercussion and then zoom back to tell you the story. So almost always, if it's quick, it's structured according to a superhero narrative where, you know, the superhero is the decay of British democracy. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, like the structure is fundamentally mm-hmm. that. I mean, that, yeah, that's quite an interesting yeah. way to think about it, especially as someone that, you know, I, I grew up reading graphic novels and comics as well. So, yeah, it's mm-hmm. uh, to, again, I think that's taken something that is a, uh, that can be quite a dry topic. I know more people are interested in politics now, perhaps, than than have been for a long time. But generally, you know, some of this stuff is very dry. But at the same time, as I say, I think your your pieces in particular are, are very good at, at drawing you in and getting getting the important pieces out. So it's interesting to hear that okay. hear that structure. Um, but when you wrote Brexit, what the hell happens now? I mean, you you give us a slight insight into the 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 process there, but. You know, first of all, why did you want to write that book? What made you want to to get that out there? Uh, okay, well, I mean, in terms of what what happened, it's basically because my publisher phoned me up and went, "Do you want right. to write this okay. book?" And I was like, "Yeah, I would love to write it." Um, and he has twice, I mean, twice in my life, he has said one sentence um, that has basically defined the next period of my work. And you know, in the first case, it was the title of my first book, and in the second case, it was the title of my second book. And 
as soon as the, the just the sentence was there in my head, you could just see these boxes of the things you wanted to say, which are all sort of in a, in a kind of a mess, just slot into place. And you see the pathway and you're like, right, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's, I see the argument. I see that. I see the narrative. I know what I've got to do here. Um, so I give, he deserves enormous credit. And if you would have any, you know, in your working life, if you find someone who in a very short space can inform you on what it is that you already wanted to do, fucking hold that person tight, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're crucial to you. Um, in terms of what was the function of it, I mean, the main function was basically that I think that there is radicalism in the, the whole concept of having knowledge at the moment with where we are politically. Mm-hmm. The, the, the project of Brexit was won and pursued on the basis of ignorance. And I'm not talking about, you know, whether it's a good idea to leave or a bad idea. Yeah. I don't mean that to her. I couldn't give a fuck. I, I, I don't want to discuss that. What I mean is you, it wasn't a debate that was won on facts. It was a debate that was won on basically groundless aspiration. So on that basis, just to give people information, to equip them with an understanding of how do trade networks work, how do tariffs work, like... um. Uh, how does regulatory alignment work? How does the WTO work? That stuff is a radical act at the moment. Like the, the degree, the extent of our of the ignorance in our current public debate, which is a new thing but is very very prevalent, is so severe that just to equip people with understanding of the world around them is a radical act and is the starting moment by which they can challenge, they can scrutinise, they can hold their government to account. So if someone's writing that book, it's not like. I wasn't really providing an argument. It was basically just, look, for the record, this yeah. is how this shit actually works. Mm-hmm. And on the basis of that, you can go on and you know form your own conclusions. Although, I mean, I'm not going to pretend that my own conclusion wasn't quite patently obvious by the <laughs> manner in which I wrote it, but I didn't actually state it. So, so when you when when you sat down uh, to write the book, you know, you you said you had these kind of boxes, and you were like, this is what I want to hit. This is all the, all the topics I uh, want to cover. You know, what's the process there? Do you, do you basically sit down and make a list of stuff? Do you then do you plan it all out or do you say, I'm just going to go for it and see where this chapter takes me? Or do you kind of know exactly what you're going to hit in every chapter as you write? Yeah, no, you, you definitely, you know where you're, you know where you're going. Um, so mine was, you could almost write a list of sort of eight headings, <clears throat> which then turn into chapter titles. Um, then you do all the interviews. So for that book, I mean, I think I wrote that book in two months. I mean, it was really quick. Mm-hmm. And there wasn't really that much out there about what was happening written down. So I read a total of zero books for that one, which seems almost laughable given what I've just been through for the last two years of my life with the second book. Like, I, it was all interviews. So I think maybe like 30 interviews, um, usually on the phone or, you know, sometimes in a pub. Um and then you're just trying to you're trying to get as much information as you can from very very clever people. Then you're taking what they tell you and saying it to someone who doesn't know them and is also terribly clever and very experienced, and seeing if everything matches up. Mm-hmm. Basically, you're not saying it's from someone else, but just sort of basically checking people against each other and weeding out anyone that says anything that is unreliable. And some very very prominent, well-respected people will say shit to you that is massively <laughs> unreliable. As I found out when I deleted an entire page on the insurance industry about two <laughs> weeks before publication, <laughs> you know, it's, it could be quite dodgy. Um, and once you, you then end up with a pool of people that you know are completely trustworthy, that you just don't need to double check the stuff. You know, that if it comes from their mouth, mm. it's, it's bona fide. Um, and that then informs the rest of the structure. And those changes take place on the, on the back of that research. But you do start with a, with a spine. And the spine on that one didn't change all that much. The, 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 I mean, a bit's got taken out. Mostly the, all of the legal elements of that book got taken out because they were going to age too quickly. It mm-hmm. was, I was writing it during the Article 50 um, court case. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I spent way too long writing about that when you suddenly think, well, actually, by the time this comes out, it'll be two, yeah. three months from yeah. now. No one will yeah. care. Um, and the WTO got introduced probably in a, in a larger role than I would have originally anticipated. But ultimately, the, the, the overall structure was about the same. The changes usually take place within what you're saying about each chapter on the basis of expert commentary. Okay. Uh, and, the, and the new book, uh, How to Be a Liberal, um, it is, uh, I've, I've started reading that one, and it is structured in a different way. I thought in a in a quite a clever way so you've got your introduction which hit i think it's quite a hard hitting introduction in terms of like look this is what the position is now and it's just laying it out there and then it sort of goes through the history of what liberalism is and it it's told almost in a sort of story form 
a lot of the time. Um, was that, you know, is that, how did you come to that approach and that structure for that one? Thanks, man. That's it, just, I'm, it, it's just the comics. It's yeah. the comics. Again. Like, <laughs> and so I obviously, you know, my two, the main things that I read in my life are comics and politics books. Mm. And you, most politics books, you know, I love, I love, I love what I get from them. I kind of do wish that they would just make it a bit more exciting to me. Because I know that sounds like I'm a proper basic bitch, but I am a basic <laughs> bitch. Like that is what I am. And so I'm just it's sort of like, I don't understand why this can't be more exciting. I, I don't understand fundamentally why there can't be a narrative to act as a delivery system for the information that you want to impart. And that was like one of these got told to me early on in journalism was because, of course, I was full of all this wanky, pompous nonsense. Mm -hmm. Someone was just like, look, you're not writing like a poem for someone to read by candlelight. You know, you are writing for someone. They're on a bus. They're late for a meeting. They're holding onto the handrail. The paper's in the other hand. And you've just got a minute or two to get some information into their head. That's your job is to make things as easy as possible. And sometimes making things easy isn't about making them shorter. In fact, if you were to just lay out all the information in that book, you could get it down to, you know, what, like, like 50 pages, mm -hmm. and it would be much harder to consume. It's about creating the narrative delivery system where there's actually a sense of hopefully a bit of excitement mm -hmm. and a bit of mystery and romance and war and, you know, people standing up to greater powers than themselves. And then inserting what I think is crucial information, you know, what I think is the, basically the foundation of our entire civilization <laughs> um, into that narrative. And, you know, sometimes you'll be a little bit dodgy with that, you know, like the concept of the separation of powers, the concept that you need to cut power out and position it in different places so that no one person can wield too much of it. A concept that is massively under attack right now, mm -hmm. you know, under Orban in Hungary, under Trump in America, under yep. Brexit here. Um, you can kind of insert that in a number of places, right? So, I mean, I ended up inserting it around the American Revolution. You could, you could pretty much do it with John Locke, you could do it with Montesquieu, you could do it... In, so you're, you're usually a bit cheeky and you have to have a few disclaimers, which I've scattered around being like, look, for the record, you know, it's not always the first time an idea's come up. Ideas pop up and they become popularized, you know. But, so you, you have a bit of cheek there, nothing that can't be justified. Um, and you're just trying to do that, trying to basically, hopefully, like write a politics book that could be read on the beach, like on a summer yeah, holiday, that, isn't, you know, that is actually yeah. a bit thrilling, hopefully. I think it definitely could be. And it, it, it strikes me, I know you just, you said earlier, the sort of two years of hell in, in, in writing this, but mm. it, it strikes me that uh, it would have been quite a fun book to write in a lot of ways, as a, as compared to the, the first one. This one, because it has all of the elements that you've just discussed, was it good fun to write, despite it obviously taking as long as it did no it was fucking horrible <laughs> I, it was really it was awful. i hated it i, I hated pretty much every minute of it i oh, don't want to i i don't i i went right another book like i at least oh, really years. yeah like, at least two years like i well, fucking it, it it almost killed me like, it was, it, it, it's awful is I, it I, is I, it the length of time is, is the the pure time it takes to write a book compared to a column is is, is yeah, it's, it about it's just really hard. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, this. it's really a very difficult thing to do. First of all, there's like all the reading. I mean, the reading is insane. I'm looking right now, if this was a video casting, I'd put my camera over. I'm looking right now at the pile of books. I couldn't even, it's just thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of stuff that's usually pretty difficult. You know, like, yeah. I mean, when you're getting into like, um, like Isaiah Berlin's theory of value pluralism, that's actually really hard. Like it's really, really difficult stuff. You're getting into sort of Hayekian um, economics and then trying to be in a position to hopefully dismantle it, which I mean, admittedly, actually, I'm not going to lie. Dismantling Hayekian economics is not actually that fucking hard, but whatever, <laughs> you know, you've still got to get it. You've still got to understand it. Um, that is really difficult and, and quite sort of psychologically demanding. Then trying to extract what is exciting from it and then trying to really form um, a confident view of the material that you're dealing with was really difficult and it was harder than the last book really because each time i moved chapter i was back to page one you know like i mean suddenly it's okay now it's the glorious revolution and i know nothing about that i couldn't build up the background knowledge over the course of writing the book because the book moves over the course of 400 years so each time you just reset right mm -hmm. back to zero 
Um, so I'm not going to there was definitely moments that I had pleasure, like those people I discovered, particularly Benjamin Constant and particularly Harriet Taylor Mill, who I just think are just the most remarkable human beings and are massively under discussed. And it was a privilege to like find their story and to be able to tell people their story. But most of the time it was just really difficult and me sitting around just like actually like demolishing Chablis in the evenings, like the <laughs> fucking just smashing Chablis and weeping and the missus being, it'll be all right. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be all right. That was basically the last two years. Was, I don't think I've ever asked a question that was so wrong in, in, its, in its asking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, there's always a there's always a first and so do, do, when you're when you're writing a longer form piece like that for, like a book um do you show it do you share it with other people bef during the process or do you sort of push through to the finish before you yeah. share it no I, I push through to the finish um and then I showed it to a lot I mean individual chapters right I mean mm -hmm. only you know my my publisher and the missus sort of care enough about me to read the whole thing at that <laughs> stage right like um, so no it's chapter by chapter um and you're showing it i mean i think that the list is in the back i mean it's pretty thick it's probably about i don't know i think it's probably about 50 60 people um sort of experts in in their field whether it's in you know adam smith or you know in keynesianism or uh the financial crash or identity politics or whatever you're just two or three of them for each chapter mm -hmm. Um, and then going back so yeah they've gone over it but that was part of the the drafting process the the, the drafting process of each chapter was pretty epic and mm -hmm. sort of based on can i go into that actually that might be yeah that absolutely yeah, yeah and so it was i mean the first thing is just reading about four or five books um for each topic of which there's sometimes multiple topics within a chapter so you just do that you go through it putting either one two or three lines in the text according to how important you think that section will be for you then going back through those books and taking the information that you found there and basically typing it out in terms of the actual data that you mm -hmm. need. Um, and then organizing that according to the structure of the chapter. Then writing out the chapter, and that's basically the first draft. And at that point, it's essentially about 60% other people's work, right? You're just yeah. doing little links between the thing. Then going over it one more time. And then you call up the experts once you think you've got a handle on what you're doing. And then you speak to hopefully sort of four or five experts in the field. You batter it around. You want to speak to as many experts that don't agree with you as possible. It's so like me trying to track down people who are very sympathetic towards Russo, who I think is a twat, but they disagree. And that's fair enough. And then, you know, there, and there are things to, to value there, but not a lot. Um, then on the basis of those conversations, doing another draft, it's about the third draft. And then the crucial part, which which is like the drunken draft. So I sort of, I then drink like about three glasses of wine, like no more than three, but no less than two. Yeah. And do another run through on the chapter. And then I, like you just let the flowery shit out. Like it just gets really, really very florid uh -huh. indeed. And then the next morning, while you've still got a hangover, while there's still like a, like a good amount of self-hate, <laughs> you then go and do the next draft, which means you like cut out 90% of what you wrote the night before, but you keep 10%, 10 of the story. Yeah. And then you leave it alone for a month, hopefully do another chapter, just think about something else, and then go back, and then that's the final draft. And so that process, it is kind of a, it's a process based on research, but also based on talking with a lot of experts. Mm -hmm. And then often they or other experts were the ones that would then get sent those chapters um, to look over them and just say, look, am I making a tit of myself here? What do you think is logically not working? What's factually not working? You know, and also what's not working in terms of the quality of my writing, but that part I obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and, but in that process, by going through that, that whole process, by the time you're given the final draft to your editor, are you still getting back a lot of notes uh, from your oh, editor? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, man. He's a firm, I, I, I'm with him for a reason, right? Which is that um, he's not really a publishing guy. I don't really understand publishing people. They just, there's a lot of euphemism and a lot of smiling. And I find both of those things very difficult to understand. Uh, he's a former newspaper guy. So he's just like, it's shit. I really like it. So, and that's what I need. Like, I just need someone to just go, it's shit. And, and so, yeah, so he rewrites pretty heftily. He won't stand for any extraneous mm -hmm. words pretty much at all. Um, so we'll knock it backwards and forwards probably for another two drafts right. by the end. And then another sort of, and then the final read through was literally just before it goes to print, even mm. after it's been proofed, just like, is there anything here, mm -hmm. you know, that isn't working? And then even then we'll, we'll dive in and do a little change, which by the way, you shouldn't do. Like children always read the medicine label, like 
do not touch your copy when it's been proved. But, <laughs> you know. Well, it's it's that it's the it's the thing that happens. I think in everyone's writing, which is that you always think there's something you can go back and 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 improve or or change. It's yeah. it's difficult to just say right, that's it. I'm not going to touch this again. Yeah, yeah, it's fucking hard. Um, well, then, so let's so. You've written your two factual books, and the last one you absolutely hated, and you said you wouldn't write another book again. But no way! Can I be does... clear that I really like the book? <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> books, are funny. books are great in the writing process. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it does sound like your new book was an was quite an epic, right? You know, it, it, I, I can totally see that having to start every chapter from scratch and all the research is a monumental task. But with that, has that whole process of writing that book put you off, perhaps writing? A comic book or a fiction book, something that's a little, maybe I don't use the word easier because obviously every writing can be can be hard, but something that's not so research heavy. Oh no, not at all. Like I'm no, I'd be no good at that shit. Like I, you, you've got you should you should know what you are, you know. And I and I'm like I'm a I'm a hack like that. I'm I'm a journo. Like basically that is what I, that's that's what I want to be. And I think also you've really got to put in the time, you know, on the thing that hopefully you're yeah. already quite good at to be good at it. Mm -hmm. like that's the main thing is just putting in the fucking hours and i put them in like i know how to do this thing now this is a thing that i can do and, and like the other stuff if i i'm in awe of people that can write fiction like most of the time i read it, i i think it, it's just like an extraordinary skill that i don't think i have and certainly if i was gonna ever get to that point it would take me hours mm -hmm. hours sorry it would take me years <laughs> you know years of practice to try and get there but it's also that you know i want um fundamentally the it's it's the journalism that I do is the journalism of commitment. Mm -hmm. It's a commitment to the world and of actually trying to change the world for the better. That doesn't mean that you ever change your facts to adapt for your political campaign. It's not about, you know, being partisan. It's about thinking that honest journalism with conviction does good for the world on its own right. And hopefully by virtue of its consequences as well. And that's the thing that I want to do. And if I was able to do that in my career, that I would consider that like a life very well lived. I, I wouldn't feel the need to do anything else. If they want to invite me to write the next DC summer event, I will fucking write that shit. <laughs> I'll fuck it all up right now. They don't understand those characters. They've got the community, the continuity all messed up, and yep. I will take it on. But <laughs> on the idea that they probably won't invite me, I, I will leave that. To you. We'll, we'll 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 use that quote and see if they pick it up on the after the podcast yeah. goes out. <laughs> I think they're restructuring at the moment anyway, so so you never know. Oh, it's a perfect time thing to jump on then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, on a completely different topic, I had I want to ask you because because you are so prominent on Twitter, um, you will you are exposed in a way that I think perhaps only one of our previous guests, being Alistair Campbell, um, has been exposed mm. to, which is the sort of bio and hatred of a lot of people that just disagree with your views. I mean, how, how do you? What is your coping mechanism for that? Do you just ignore it? you know never engage block what you know how how do you deal with that sort of thing yeah that, that is an ever evolving question um the first time the first time that happened it was quite startling and i'd written i think it was for the guardian and it was on it was something to do with identity politics i can't remember what and i've been seeing a play and i switched on my phone and the first text i saw was from my friend saying are you okay and i was like oh shit who's died and then i turned out my reputation. <laughs> so it was like, you, you switched on Twitter and it was just extraordinary. I'd never seen, because you know, at that point, I probably had like, I don't I like, I don't know, like a thousand followers. Like I, I wasn't used to seeing my mentions column. Yeah. At like, like I was playing um, fucking roulette or something. Like it was just hammering away and everyone was telling me that I was a dick. And <laughs> but, but not just that, you know, it was, it, you know, it was stuff like, you know, you, you, you're, a, you're a threat to black people was one of the, th I remember that, I remember that sentence, you know, because I basically said it was about free speech. I think it was about um, safe spaces in university or something. And I had thought like a fool, and this is something I now advise people against, that after having written, you know, from a pro-immigration perspective and written, you know, extremely critical journalism about the Home Office for about six years of my life, mm -hmm. that I would have some sort of standing, you know what I mean? Like, it would be like, oh, you know, he's clearly on our side. Yeah. So maybe there's, and there's like, of course not. No, absolutely not. Um, and I was at the bottom of that for probably two or three days, just being like sort of told the most awful things. Um, and it sort of hardens you a bit. Um, what you don't want is to harden to the point 
where you become a sort of sociopath, yeah. right? And you see that, I think, from, again, I'm not going to name them, but some pretty sort mm-hmm. of prominent commentators yeah. who, who have just lost any, you know, the way they argue and the things they say and the way that they seem to almost enjoy the abuse. You just think that there's something that doesn't look healthy. That doesn't look like a good way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, I mean, if you're a liberal, if you're basically a sort of center-left liberal, you're gonna you're gonna fucking get it hard from everyone. <laughs> like you know, the, this week it's it's the sort of far right because I've been writing about refugee stuff. You know, more often than not, I'd say it's the Corbyn guys. Yeah. Um, same with lots of the sort of identity politics stuff. Less so from the centre right, but certainly you know from the Brexiters. I obviously had that for years. So you, you're pretty much getting it all over. Um, the points that it gets difficult and the points that I've struggled, so the general policy is don't reply, don't, you know, who cares? Just yeah. let them be and, you know, you focus on your work and make sure your work is good quality and speak to the people that you know that are your friends. They're Twitter friends sometimes, you know, sometimes they're real life friends, mm-hmm. but often but Twitter friendship is, is a thing, right? And those relationships do mean something. Like, yeah. Quite a bit sometimes. Um, sometimes people write stuff that you're like, look, you are lying about me and it is kind of grating <laughs> like you know, that is, there's no way that anyone could not be upset that you're just being lied about and then of course it's swirling around so you're seeing other people say you know yeah. oh, um, so it can be difficult but most of the time like my, my general mechanism is like when i've written a reply to someone usually a bitterly angry one pointing out that i'll sort of just say to the missus i'm about to send this is this a good idea and the answer 100 percent of the time is no like, what are you doing like, why would you do that and then i don't send it yeah well that's probably the base mechanism for dealing with that actually uh, yeah but i know i i just um it's not that i'm in awe that's obviously the wrong word but you know when i've got into a small twitter spat about something completely stupid football or something like that it it hangs about with me it, you know, it, it oh, doesn't totally. go away. Even when you're not on Twitter, you're, it, puts, it affects your mood and everything like that. So I can only imagine what what the sort of... I mean, I'm not, I now sound like I'm trying to make you feel bad, which is not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose but, it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you have an argument with someone in at like a party or whatever, and the argument lasts for as long as that as you're in that space with, with, with that person, and then you both leave and the argument's done. But when you have an argument with someone online, it's there. You can pull up and you can look at it again whenever you want, word for word, mm. and you, you can't escape. Also, and also, other people can jump in on there. Well, exactly, everyone's listening to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's, mm. it's, it's, it's a really. It must be difficult to to not engage with them, especially when they're saying something you know is not true. I think, but I think that must be the answer. Is as soon as you go down to that level, it, you, you can't win because you will never you'll never see anything that convinces them otherwise, and there's no point in even trying. <laughs> yeah, and also remember the rules of the game will break you because they're not this is not an argument that's being had on the basis of you know what is true yeah. or it's not that yeah, exactly it, it's really being based on can, can they hurt you you know if you mm. look at most answers on twitter most ads in the middle of you know a pile on or something like that they're really just trying to say the thing that they think would, would most upset the other person um so if you're going to if you're going to become embroiled in that the only way to win that game you know the 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 only way you'd win it with any grace would just to be the snarkiest guy. Yeah. You don't want to be that. And most of the other options are way down the list from that. It's just to be just the most awful person you can be. So you kind of just have to tell yourself you do win by not taking part. Like the, the biggest victory you can have is just not descending to yeah. that level. I know yeah. that sounds like you're a fucking teacher talking to it, but you know, that, that is it. You just want to not mm-hmm. descend to that level. Hopefully keep yourself away from it, but also like protect your time. Like you, just usually don't have the time like that there's a certain amount of emotional energy that will go into those disputes mm-hmm. but it's also they will take you ages you know you'll be online for three four hours and you'll have achieved fuck all and there's probably things you could have done that would be a better use of that time yeah definitely well on to hopefully cheerier topic which is uh, so you're not going to write another book <laughs> but what what have you got i mean <laughs> apart from the the day-to-day journalism have you got anything else bigger planned and coming up at all no man no i just want to i would i mean first of all i i really really want to do fuck all for a <laughs> like, i can't i'm quite lazy and i've been forced to work like seven days a week for the last two years and i just want to do nothing yep. for a good long time um and then the, i mean the journalism the journalism suffers in so far as you're writing a book because it, you're not you don't have that extra time so i just want to be doing much more of the journalism now a lot of your time is obviously book promotion and that'll be the next sort of four months of my life really um 
And there's something doing the journalism like right now, these guys are going to get away with all sorts of shit unless they're held to account. And they're probably mm. going to get away with it, even if they are held to account. And they're going to do it. I mean, they're doing it right now in refugees. They're going to do it on judicial review. If they get a chance, they'll do it with the BBC. Yeah. They're going to attack, attack, attack. They are going to try and fight. I mean, what works for them is culture war. So they will pursue the culture war wherever they can find it, wedge issues to try and divide people. The complete antithesis of how a liberal democracy is supposed to function, that you hope for political parties that are searching for what unites people rather than divides them. That is not the kind of government we're going to have. We're going to have these drunken vandals shattering things that they do not understand and hurting the most marginalized and vulnerable people in society. And therefore, like journalism has a profound moral function in that dimension. I'm kind of just grateful that I have the time again just to go back into that and take the fight. I also have to add, like on a more selfish thing, the the labor reward timetable on journalism mm. is much more satisfying than with books. Yeah. With books, yeah. it's two years of labor and then some yeah. social recognition. With journalism, it's a week or maybe an hour, you know? Yeah. So it's, it, in terms of the regime of what your brain requires of, you know, sort of like to keep it stimulated, it's, it's actually... It, it, it feels almost like eating junk food doing journalism. I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's like instant reward, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean. constantly coming. It's a very satisfying I love junk food. <laughs> yeah, you want me to, to be honest. Yeah, but I didn't want to understand. Um, and uh, when, for politics, uh, .co UK, uh, the, your editor, uh, um, how does that work in terms of, uh, you know, assigning work and you know on a date i'm just thinking on a in a busy day at parliament how do you decide how does everyone decide right i'll write this or or whatever you know how does that process well, there isn't work? Much to decide. i mean there hasn't been for the last sort of few years because brexit was the only story mm -hmm. kind of going and most of the time it's just me commissioning things that i think are not being talked about enough elsewhere mm -hmm. um so there's a, a lot of things that i sort of let Fly, just I think they're pretty well covered sort of, sort of transport stories or things like that where I, I you know I mean I think there's a lot of coverage of HS2 or whatever and, yeah. and probably it's not particularly striking there's areas that are much less covered and the immigration system is the most obvious one mm -hmm. um the effects of the criminal justice system extraordinary how in this country we basically just don't seem to give a shit about what goes on in prisons prisons are catastrophically fucked in this country decades of underfunding of governments coming in and habitually trashing whatever worked on an evidence-based policy because it's almost always described in one of the rare pieces of coverage of prison policy as some kind of you know soft you know liberal approach and giving prisoners playstations and blah 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 mm -hmm. and you it's quite hard to get attention to it so with most of that it's trying to find stories that aren't being properly covered elsewhere um brexit was not an example of that yeah. i did spend three years writing <laughs> about it but you know for the majority yeah, yeah. of the cases <laughs> You also then, of course, need to find the angle that will get people to read it. So when we were writing about prison policy, the best thing that ever happened, I think, for, for, for prison reformers in general, was when Chris Grayling took over at the Ministry of Justice. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems odd because he is obviously, like, he is, like, redundancy in human form, like a complete <laughs> intellectual chasm and, and terrible, genuinely awful. But people love to hate him. They, they love to hate him. And so for years, I would write about prison policy without really getting much attention. People just don't care. They care about the NHS because they go to hospital. They care about schools because they have kids that go to school. They don't really care about prisons. Yeah. Um, and yet, as soon as he took over, people did care because it was Grayling. So you could just write a story. That basically, had a headline of Grayling's a dick. And the first three lines of Grayling's a dick. And then afterwards, you get to just talk about prison policy. So, you know, 20 parts. It was great. It was easy. And so having that, having a sense of how you're tapping into... Yeah people's narrative and, and their own sense of who they are and their politics allows you to then smuggle in what I think is yeah. important sort of public information. I, I'm ashamed to say, actually, I mean, it's true. Like, I know more about the American prison system because mm -hmm. of the, you know, the 13th and, and yeah. Louis Theroux visiting the prisons there and stuff than I do about the British one. It's true, the coverage is, isn't there. Or I know you have covered it, but, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, get more widespread focus so that's for that's for sure yeah that's interesting right and, and also, uh, the distinction that i think there is that america as in all areas of public policy essentially operates a sort of racialized prison system mm -hmm. um and so 
you know, I don't want to sound too clinical about this. That, that is what it is. Objectively, that is what it is. In the same way that, you know, the war on drugs is, it was invented mm -hmm. as a racist operation and continues mm -hmm. to have profound racial effects right now. Um, I think in terms of journalism with American prisons, it's easier to get coverage there because it's part of a broader narrative that is about race relations yeah. in the US. Whereas here, mercifully, that's not the case, but it also has the effect that people have less of a, a sort of background narrative to why they're going into yeah. the story. Yeah. What was the last book that you read? Ah, fuck me. And it What's can it be a, it can be a comic if you want as well. I've not read that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll go. I mean, I'm not going to talk to you about the last comic. I mean, I could, but I won't. You asked me the last book. Um, so it's Tidelands. What is she called? Oh, yeah. Um, I've heard of it. Um, I can't remember her name. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. Um, can I look it up? No, yeah, um, yeah, 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 no, no go, sorry, for go for it. Yeah, it's Philippa Gregory. Yeah. Um, so it's Tidelands by Philippa Gregory. Um which is set in the English Civil War, which is a period I'm obviously fascinated in. It's, it's in the book. Um, I've been watching a shitload of films about the English Civil War at the moment, including Field in England um, and Fanny, Fanny Lynn Delivered. It's, this ama it's an amazing period of history because it's, it, writers always come up with their best and so do filmmakers when they're touching on it because it's just this period of tumultuous change. And it usually produces very strange stories of sort of structures that are breaking down and eroding underneath your feet. Um, and, of, you know, the fact it's Tidelands. Right? I mean, in that book, you can't even tell what, what is land and what is sea, mm -hmm. basically. And that gives you some sort of overall indication of the kind of dynamics working within it. It's really beautifully written, wears its research very, very lightly. It's really fucking good, actually. Nice. And there was one, yeah, there's one after that, and I'm not going to mention it because lots of people liked it, and I thought it was a part of shit, and I'm not going <laughs> to... We'll, we'll ask you that once we start recording. For the last one that I actually liked. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what was the last film that you watched? Uh, the last film I watched was called um, uh, La Llorona, which is, I watched it last night. So it's um, a Guatemalan horror film from this year. Um, it is, I'm half Guatemalan, right? So I declare my interest of, I may have, I almost certainly have a, a higher degree of interest in Guatemalan politics than <laughs> in this country. Um, it is unbelievably brilliant. Um, it's, so La Llorona is, is the crying woman, right? It's that, it's that kind of, that myth that goes across various cultures, mm -hmm. uh, like the woman in black, I think is a version of the same one. You get the same thing in, I think in, in India, there's a similar one of like the, the weeping ghost woman who's mm -hmm. lost her children. But in this case, it's applied to uh, children that were killed uh, during the genocide of the Maya in sort of 1982, 1983 by the uh, kind of militarist fascist mm -hmm. government of Rios Mont. Uh, and Rios Mont features in this barely concealed i mean they made no fucking effort to conceal that at all and he's basically this guy haunted uh -huh. by her um what's incredible about it is he's essentially I, i'm not these are no spoilers he's he's it's a haunted house movie or a cabin in the woods movie but the reason he can't leave is because of these protesters outside mm -hmm. meanwhile he's haunted by by the, the crying woman la llorona and constantly what you hear from the protesters is this you know the chant no justice no peace but no justice, no peace is actually the mechanism of the haunted house. Like that is the thing that is torturing him within the, mm -hmm. the haunted house. So it is that thing that horror can do when you really get it right of, of getting its themes and getting its moral message yeah. and wrapping it around this incredibly like powerful structure. Really, I mean, really elegantly done. Uh, it's hard to get hold of. It's on Shudder, which is a fucking TV service yeah. I've never heard of until yesterday. But if you get a chance, honestly, whether you're interested in Guatemala or Latin American politics or not, if you're just a horror fan, it is. Yeah, oh, no, I'm, a, I'm a, a big, a big fan, big fan of of the horror scene. So I definitely have to have a look at that. That sounds excellent. And uh, what was the last TV show that you watched, or the series that you're watching just now? Oh, sorry, it's boring. It, it's Succession. Yeah. No. So I've gone that. No, no, that's an excellent choice, but that's fair enough. Thank you. I mean, and I could fucking happily talk about that for the next ten hours, but I'm not <laughs> going to do because you have fucking heard that shit. Everyone, uh, everyone knows what everyone is about Succession. It is unbelievably brilliant uh you know and, and anyone that hasn't seen it should obviously rectify that yeah immediately. absolutely <laughs> yeah the, the, the very final thing we do is a quick fire either or uh there's no right answers except for one uh, and we'll start with the first one uh johnson or trump Wait, 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 who do I want to fuck more? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we let you bring which one do you prefer yeah i suppose that's right yeah 
uh, and I can't explain my answer. I just have no, to you, one you, we'll let you explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bastards. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we asked Alistair Campbell this, so it was. I'm actually quite intrigued by his. Answer. Okay, the thing is, obviously, Johnson is more intelligent, um, and and he is less of a, you know, he's less of a fascist. Um, in the, Johnson actually isn't a fascist, and Trump would be if if he could understand mm -hmm. what that actually meant. <laughs> um, however, Trump is a genuine racist, so he does have convictions. I mean, they're the worst convictions available to humanity, but he has convictions, whereas Johnson has none, which makes it quite hard. Like, would you rather take dreadful convictions or none at all? I think it's I'd hard. go for none That's at all. That's hard. Yeah. Johnson, <laughs> fine, so Johnson. I'm sorry. I, I, whatever. Johnson, I'll take Johnson. <laughs> Um, Marvel or DC? DC. Excellent. Uh, real book or ebook? Real book, the fuck? Who answers e? Oh, sorry, no. I mean, apart from all the wonderful people who want to buy my ebook and never. <laughs> <laughs> you, no, I'm, I'm afraid. Never... I'm afraid that was the one question you've, you know, you've made Tarek the cry. Then no one says. So... Hardly anyone <laughs> says ebook. What well, ebooks are better? No. Absolutely. Only... Think, of the, think of the convenience. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Okay, look, and I, I had an ebook for I had a whatever a Kindle for like a year, and, and it could slip into my jacket pocket when I went to work in Birmingham. And then I released that first book, and I did a bunch of talks in bookshops. And I smelt them and I looked around them and they're the most beautiful. And I don't want to be a bourgeois twat about it, but they are the most beautiful fucking object in the world. And I want more of that shit in my life. I want to be able to feel things, touch them. I want, you know, I want record players. I want books. And I, I, yeah, looking at text on screen is, is not for me. It's not for me. <laughs> no, well, you'll be happy to hear that you're, you're along with, Nearly all of our past guests chooses real book, which always disappoints. Only been, there's only been a couple of winners. So far, yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of losers there so far in this podcast. <laughs> um, a, a fancy restaurant or a takeaway? It's, it's different nights, isn't it? You know, yeah. I don't know. You don't want to. There's no greater pleasure, right, than like having a bottle of wine with the missus in a nice restaurant. So it's going to be. You're going to take that over the nights that you just want to veg and eat. Like a stuffed crust pizza and watch Batman for the fucking ten millionth time. Both I are good though. I love doing that shit, and it's hard, it's a hard decision to make. But are you going to go for the fancy restaurant with this? Is the original Batman? No, 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 no. Oh, the Nolan. Oh, okay, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like. I've got time for the whole Biff Baff Boff stuff, but you, you you generally want a bit of crunch in there. And he's it's, it's a very crunchy Batman. That one. It's not, not not as much Batman crunch as Batfleck though. Right. Yeah, yeah, not Batman. <laughs> no, no, not so much. <laughs> well, it was all going swimmingly until until this massive rant, which I have to say, I don't really agree with one bit. So. <laughs> about this is, of course, about the real book versus ebook argument. Yes, that. yes, I was quite, I was quite enjoying our chat with you, and then I'm completely gone off on now. I'm afraid we should actually just rename the podcast to "Real Book or Ebook," and <laughs> that yeah. could determine whether you're willing to sit sit with the guest. Which exactly? Yeah. Which, let's face it, Derek, I think about forty one times you wouldn't probably have... going solo. I think in most of these <laughs> yeah, podcasts. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I thought that was a really interesting chat with you, and um, it was yeah. really good to hear about how you go about structuring, you know, taking something that's quite a dry and sometimes really complicated subject, something like Brexit, for example, yeah. all the stuff about that, and how he manages to take all that information and distill it into something that's easy to understand, but also entertaining as well, yeah. which is yeah. which is a, a real skill, I think. It is, it's such a, a such a separate skill than writing a book. You know, writing a novel is, especially if it's one that's completely based on your own imagination, is just is, is one thing, and, and it's something else completely to take existing information that's out there and put it down into one book, and as you say, make it funny and interesting. And mm -hmm. that is, that's a really hard thing to do. And and also just like, as he was saying, not being afraid to just keep asking questions, keep saying you don't understand until you do understand, because that's yeah. how you get to the heart of these things. And then once you understand, you can distill that information to other people. Oh, totally. We've all read way. stuff that's, that's someone that's explaining something that they clearly don't understand yeah. themselves. And by the end of it, you say, well, I, I'm more confused than I was before. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Having, a, having a basic level of understanding of something is i think step one for sure yeah so um as as we said at the start uh, how to be a liberal is really i think a great book and a really important book just now so 
I would definitely recommend grabbing a copy of that um, if you can. I think it's available on ebook as well as uh, in hardback as well, it I think. It better be available on ebook. <laughs> yeah, otherwise you yeah. won't be reading it, Tarek. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thanks again for taking the time uh, to record that, Ian. Really appreciate you doing that. Um, and we've got another great guest next week who, in in a tangential way, is kind of linked through the comic. Oh, that's, through... that's right. There is a Batman link to next week's guest because we are chatting with Mr. Dirk Maggs, who is, uh, well, he's a superstar, I suppose, in the world of audio movies, he calls them. Yeah, really a pioneer, I would say. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in turning, you know audio drama into something much bigger and as he he likes to call them audio movies because they are more than an audio drama there's sound effects there's music there's everything that you would get in a movie but brought in audible in audio form and i don't know his name may not be a name that you know but i suspect if you've listened to one of the big audio things on audible or one of these services recently i suspect he has had some hand in it or whoever has made that has been inspired by his work because yeah as we learn next week it's a very long um chat we had with Dirk but really interesting from the start to today um how he uh, built this whole thing up from his time working at the BBC um into what his latest drama was which is the uh, the Sandman adaptation Neil Gaiman's The Sandman which is available on Audible and is quite frankly pretty amazing i thought yeah yeah yeah. one of these things where you think how would they turn a comic book which is such a visual medium into an audible book Mm -hmm. and it works really well yeah it's 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 incredible so it's a really in-depth chat we had with dirk we hear about the whole process how he, he as we say started this whole process really back in the days of tape uh to to the digital age now and um what he's trying to achieve when he makes these things so yeah. um it's a bit different i suppose from our usual uh, episodes but it's definitely worth tuning in for yeah it's a really really fun chat um so uh, before i go i will do my usual plea for uh, ratings and reviews if if possible on uh, your favorite podcast app certainly on apple Podcasts, you can leave a review and a rating and that helps us climb the charts which helps us Um, get better guests so that you can keep uh, getting their hints and tips well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below and if you want to get in touch you can always drop us a tweet in the twitter machine which is at uk page one as evidenced here and our other social media channels are available otherwise we hope to see you next episode see you later